Hi, everybody. Looks like I'm now unmuted. Um, welcome to this GMAT Club session with Admission Nato. We are a proud partner of GMAT Club. We are an admissions consulting company specializing in undergraduate applications as well as MBA applications, which is the reason I'm guessing all of you are here today on this Friday. Hope you're all having a good morning or good evening wherever you may be joining us from. So let me introduce myself. My name is Doris Huang. I am a senior consultant with Admission Nato, once again, specializing in MBA applications. I've been doing this for several years now, and I am also an alum of the Wharton School. So that's the reason why I am here to speak to you today about the Wharton Team-Based Discussion, or TBD. Uh, my guess is that many of you may have received invitations, and that's why you're trying to uh, hone your skills in this very unique interview format before you dive into it. Um, congratulations to those of you who have received invitations. If you're still waiting, we have our fingers crossed for you that you get good news soon. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen for this presentation. I have pres prepared for you some slides that should help take us through our journey of preparing for the TBD. Uh, so again, Admission Nato, this is us. You can find out more about us if you're interested in potentially getting some help. Um, if you have round two applications still outstanding, for example, we partner one on one with clients who are going through the application process. Um, you can find us on uh, www.admissionnato.com or also on the GMAT Club site. And again, welcome to this YouTube live session. This will be recorded and available for viewing after the fact in GMAT Club's YouTube channel. So uh, if you're don't need to worry about scrambling to take notes. This is something you can review after the fact, and you can just focus on the presentation for today. So again, let's uh, talk briefly before we dive into the details about the purpose of the session today. So the Warden TBD, I'm sure all of you have read about it, heard about it. Perhaps you have colleagues who've gone through the process before. It is a unique format, as I mentioned. And we're going to talk a little bit about why Wharton uses this format. Um, there is a method behind the madness, having gone through it myself, I can vouch for its effectiveness at meeting the goals that Wharton has set out for this particular interview format. We're going to go through a high-level overview of how the TBD works, what you can expect if you're about to go through it yourself, some strategy and tips, of course, at a high level for how to do really well, given the purpose of the uh, session. And then we're going to dive into a few different scenarios. So just to prepare all of you for the types of other characters that you might encounter, because again, it's a group interview. You really don't know. I mean, it's luck of the draw. Who else is going to end up in the room with you, so to speak? It's all done virtually this year, but who will be in your session? That's not something you can control or predict, but there are certain archetypes of uh, people, personalities, really, that you might expect to run into. And I just want to go through those with you so that it's not shocking um, if, if it turns out that one of these types of people is in your session. And it's also a cautionary tale to make sure that you check yourself. If you have some of these tendencies in your personality, um, the scenarios I'm going to bring up are tend to be negative ones. They, they are the types of individuals that uh, don't fare well in the Wharton TBD format. So it's a good time for us to self-reflect, ask yourself the tough questions. Is this you know, do I have, again, the tendencies to behave in this way? And if you do, now is the time to be aware of that and to ensure that you're prepared to keep those tendencies in check during the TBD. Um, and then finally, towards the end, we'll briefly talk about the one-on-one -on -one interviews, which are very short. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what to expect there. And then we'll finish with a Q&A session, um, which Abhijit from GMAT Club will moderate in the chat. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and type it into the chat at any time, um, or just take a quick note of your question, and then you can bring it up in the chat room at the end of the session. All right, let's dive in. From 30,000 feet, before we even talk about the nuts and bolts of the interview, let's understand why Wharton has a team-based discussion as part of its application process. What's the point of the TBD? Well, first of all, um, the AdCom wants to observe how well you play in a professional team setting. If you think about it, this is something that every business school says is very important to them. You know, are you collaborative? How do you lead other people? How do you follow other people? Um, it's pretty obvious that during business school, this is going to be something that you're going to be doing quite a lot of. And also in the workplace, you know, most of you have work experience, at least a few years under your belt by the time you're applying to business school. And you know, there's very few jobs um, out there in the business world where you don't have to collaborate with others, right? So 
it's it's a given that most all business schools care a lot about teamwork. However, if you think about it, it's a pretty difficult thing to test for in the application process. Sure, your letters of recommendation might speak to your ability to work on teams. Um, perhaps you have one or two stories in your essays that also address teamwork, but to actually simulate this, that's pretty, that's pretty unique, right? And, and not a lot of business schools have the resources to be able to do that. So Wharton wants to see in a, in a test environment how good you are at being part of the team, right? And again, this is an indicator of success, not only at Wharton when you're in, in business school, but also beyond. Second, uh, the other point of the TBD is to gauge your level of interest and in commitment to Wharton specifically. So um, they're, they're obviously looking to assemble a class of people who are very enthusiastic about Wharton, who are going to be wonderful contributors while they're in school and also uh, as alumni in the future. So uh, this is why the prompt is not a general business topic. It's not about a current event in the business world or in the political world. It is about something very specific to Wharton. And it's actually quite I think it's quite savvy of Wharton every year they pick a topic um, that's very timely. So it's usually some new development on campus, a new program, perhaps they're looking to launch or a new curriculum and they want to get your feedback on it. Uh, so it's pretty smart. So not only is it a way for them to see how engaged you are in the Wharton community um, and how excited you are about it, but it's also a way for them to get free insight. <laughs> it's like free consulting for Wharton. Uh, I'm sure they take some of these ideas that come out of the team-based discussions and they implement them in real life. So we will uh, talk about what the topic is this year because that was just released with the invitation uh, in a moment. Third and final point of the TBD is to weed out bad apples, right? So I alluded to this a little bit uh, uh, in the last slide when we were introducing this session. Wharton has worked really hard to manage and to mitigate its cutthroat reputation. So um, I would say certainly it's hard to put a number of years to it, but you know, certainly 10, 15 years ago, Wharton had a reputation, rightly or wrongly, for turning out very aggressive business people, very aggressive uh, MBA graduates. And again, uh, whether that was true or not might be up for debate, but the reality is uh, it's a perception that was out there, right? And so this is certainly something that is uh, Wharton um, treated as a negative perception they wanted to address. So by having this TBD, it really allows the adcom to observe in a almost like a petri dish environment how applicants actually play together, right? Um, it's it's actually a pretty cool exercise if you can abstract away from the the nerve wracking nature of it. You know, it's it's actually pretty interesting from a sociological standpoint. So it's a really good way for the adcom and by the way for other fellow applicants to identify the people who don't have that team based spirit that Wharton is looking for. Okay, so bear these points in mind, because um, if you think about it, this is what the adcom is looking to do. This is why they're using the TBD as part of the admissions process. If you keep this in mind and you um, make your decisions and your choices within this framework, you're going to set yourself up for success. On the flip side, let's talk about what's not the point of the TBD. Okay, what, what are not some of the goals that you or the adcom are trying to achieve in this session? Number one is to see if you or your idea wins. There's no winning, right? So you don't get bonus points if your proposal, and again, we'll talk about the specific prompt this year in a minute, but you're, you're, you're not getting bonus points or extra credit from the adcom if your idea is the one that's chosen by the group. So a lot of people sweat that. They think, gosh, I have to present, I have to present the strongest case. And I have to defend my idea to the teeth. That's not necessarily true. Remember what we saw on the previous slide. It's much, the, the point is much more about how you interact with your teammates. It's not about whether your idea is the one that's chosen at the end of the day. Okay, So you can take that worry off the table. Second non-purpose of the TBD is to learn all about your resume and goals. So if you think about it, if you received invitation, that indicates that the adcom is already impressed by your profile, right? They've seen your application. They've seen your resume, your, your essays. Um, they've read about your career goals. So this is not the time and place to spend time or focus on your own past experience or your future goals. Now, if that, if one of those things comes, is, is relevant to the um, idea that you're advocating for, or it somehow becomes relevant to the discussion that's organically unfolding, absolutely. It's, it's not, um, it's not a taboo topic. You're not prohibited from bringing up points about your past or your future. However, this is really not the focus of this discussion, okay? And it's, it's a very different type of exercise for a one-on-one -on -one MBA interview. Finally, the point of the TV is not to quiz you on your knowledge of Wharton, right? Again, um, 
two sides of the same coin. I mentioned a minute ago, of course, the topic is always Wharton specific. However, um, the, the AdCom wants to see that you have some familiarity with Wharton. You've done your homework and your research, of course, because they want to make sure you know why you want to go to Wharton. Um, but at the same time, this is not some sort of test of your knowledge, right? So you don't need to, it is not impressive, let me put it that way, to rattle off long lists of faculty at Wharton or to name drop um, alumni, right, famous or not. Uh, that's, that's really not what this, this time is for. Do your research in advance, and we're going to talk about this in more specificity in a minute when we get to the prompt. Um, but again, this is a team problem solving exercise, okay? It's not a research report or presentation. Okay. Let's go ahead now and switch gears and talk more about the logistics, the, the nuts and bolts of the actual interview. So the TBD is uh, about a 35 minute virtual team discussion with five to six applicants. So they're gonna use a virtual platform similar to Zoom. Um, again, the group size depends. So uh, don't read into that too much. It's just a matter of logistics and scheduling. So expect to be in the virtual room with another four to five applicants, right? Uh, 35 minutes is really a very short amount of time. I'm sure many of you have spent hours and hours on video meetings um, now and you realize that the time goes by very quickly. So bear that in mind, 35 minutes is, is not a lot of time here. Each candidate will be given the opportunity to do a brief self-introduction to begin, to kick off the conversation, right? Because this is the first time you're going to be meeting your teammates. So you want to talk about just high level, just what would you want to know about your teammates, right? Name geography, and probably what their profession is, right? Um, and maybe one little fun personal fact about yourself. But keep it short. Um, you know, you should expect your self-introduction to take less than 60 seconds. I would recommend practicing this. So take out your take out your iPhone or your Android and turn on the timer and just practice doing a brief self-introduction with the clock running. If you haven't done that before, you'll be surprised how time behaves when you're on the clock, so to speak, especially when you're um, in a, you know, on video, on the video screen. Practice it, get very comfortable. Um, you don't want it to sound robotic or rehearsed. You want it to sound natural, but just have an idea through practice of how long it takes you to actually introduce yourself. You might be surprised. It might go by faster than you think, or you might actually ramble and you may not notice that unless you're actually timing yourself. So I do encourage you to do that. Once each candidate has gone around the room and introduced him or herself, then the group discussion commences. There's a pre-announced prompt. We'll look at that in a minute. And again, if you receive invitation, you will have received the prompt as well. The team is expected. This is the, the, um, the point of the 35 minutes is to reach a joint conclusion. Now, this doesn't always happen. It's possible the team may not be able to coalesce around one idea. Um, don't panic if that happens. We're going to talk about some of those scenarios. You know, what, what do you do in that case? First of all, that's not within your control 100%. And the ad com knows that. Second of all, that is sometimes the way team dynamics work out. Think back into your workplace. Think about how many times a meeting is set with a specific agenda. And the boss says, okay, today we need to make a decision about X. Sometimes the team does reach a decision about X, right? But there's other times when it's discovered that there's not consensus in the room. Or perhaps somebody brings up a point that nobody had considered and needs to be researched further, right? Um, and then the result of that meeting is there's no decision reached, and that's okay. So don't you don't need to panic if you are you happen to be in a uh, TBD where you don't reach a conclusion. However, that's the the way this is structured is to get you to a conclusion as a team by the end. And usually, um, the ad call member will ask you to do a very very brief mini presentation where you address the bullet points in the prompt as a team. Following those 35 minutes, the ad com member will then go in turn, again, in the virtual room format, one by one. And there's no particular order. So don't read into the order where you ask to go first or ask to go last. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's purely luck of the draw. But you will have 10 minutes one on one with your facilitator for a brief interview. Um, and we'll talk at the end about what to expect during that session. OK, so again, if you have any questions about any of this, take note of them, put them in the chat. Um, once I get through the whole presentation, there will be time for questions at the end, okay? All right. Here it is, this year's prompt. And again, if you received invitation, you should have gotten this language already with your invitation. I'm not gonna read the whole thing um, because you already may be familiar with it. Or if you're not, you can of course read it on the screen while I'm speaking, or you can come back to this 
point in the video uh, when you're watching it afterwards. But essentially this year, the prompt is about Wharton Interactive. This is a new program that Wharton has just launched. So it's hot off the presses. And basically it's, um, it's an opportunity for Wharton to use technology in a different way within the classroom setting. So um, specifically I'll draw your attention to the second paragraph here where it talks about the courses, the academic courses that have been developed through this Wharton Interactive program or are being developed actively. They're called ARCs, alternate reality courses. So it's like a simulation, right? And Wharton has used simulations for many years, um, but they've grown increasingly sophisticated. So at this point, if you, if you read about these ARCs, I mean, it sounds just like real life. It sounds like going to a job and working with colleagues, right? You have simulated email exchanges, Zoom calls, data analysis, presentations, right? So it's really, it's, it's um, a virtual and a, um, you know, it's a staged simulation, but it's a virtual version of what your work life is like and what it will be when you graduate from business school. So it's pretty cool. Very real life, right? Um, so let's look at the third paragraph here. For the purposes of this discussion, you and a few of your classmates have been invited by Wharton Interactive to be part of a team tasked with creating the next ARC course, okay, for the MBA curriculum. So here are these bullet points. This is your mission in the TBD. Decide on the following as a team. Number one, the name of your course and the department in which it belongs. Number two, an overview of the business problem and or scenario of the ARC game that you have in mind. Number three, two learning objectives or goals, right? What is it that you want students to learn as a result of going through the ARC? And finally, two practice objectives, specific experiences you'll counter the ARC so that when you see them in the real world, you'll know what to do. So let's just um, quickly, I want to put a fine point on these last two bullet points, two learning objectives and two practice objectives. Other language for this, the first one, two academic objectives or two theoretical, conceptual framework objectives, right? If, um, what would a professor in academic say, okay, these are, these are the lessons I want my students to learn on the academic side coming out of this arc. The final bullet point by contrast is two hands-on real world lessons, okay? So what are, you know, for example, it might be managing a dispute, right? Maybe, maybe your arc is about negotiations class. And um, one of the hands-on objectives that you want students to get out of it is you want them to have practice experience managing a conflict that arises in a discussion, right? That would be a practice objective as opposed to maybe a learning objective is something more theoretical, such as, you know, understanding um, those who've taken negotiations, BATNAs, right? BATNAs are best alternatives to a negotiated agreement. It is a, um, concept within the field of negotiation study. Maybe that's the theory that you want your students to take away, but the practice is you want them to actually experience what it's like to have a dispute, right? And, and that's the practical learning, okay? So academic and pragmatic. So really these bullet points are quite clear. Uh, it's a very straightforward assignment. In terms of how to prepare for this specific prompt, it's pretty obvious from the first bullet point that you should be familiar with the different departments at Wharton. This should take you 20 minutes on the Wharton website and all the information that you need is right there and easily accessible. Uh, it's all the typical departments you would see at a business school, marketing, um, strategy, operations, et cetera. So get familiar. You don't need to, again, don't need to memorize lists of faculty members. It's more just understanding the building blocks of the Wharton faculty and therefore the curriculum that the MBAs are going through. Okay. Uh, the name of your course. So it's helpful also to sort of page through when you're looking at each of those department websites, just sort of page through the course offerings that are currently out there, whether it's core curriculum or uh, electives. Again, not to memorize anything, that's not your goal, but just to understand the context of what, what Wharton currently has available, right? And um, maybe you can start to identify gaps or you can start to identify opportunities, right? Um, for you to propose an ARC. So I would, would recommend also that you take the time before the TBD to jot down at least one and maybe even two ideas for ARCs, for specific courses that you would want to propose and, and take some time to flesh them out, write a simple outline, you know, maybe four or five bullet points that address these, uh, the, the prompt on the screen, but don't, um, don't become too attached to your idea. Cause again, as I said before, the point of the TBD is not to make sure that your idea is chosen. It's to make sure that you're, you come prepared. You've thought in advance about some smart comments you can make some logical arguments you can assemble, um, in favor of your course. And by the way, people who are very good at the TBD have the flexibility to say, okay, 
I prepared, not because I'm determined to make sure that my idea is going to win, but because that way I got the juices flowing in my brain. I started thinking about, well, what is the point of a Wharton education? What are the lessons, theoretical or practical, that I would want to learn and I would want my classmates to learn? And those those uh, observations, those insights can apply to any arc. You know, if you're someone else in the Zoom decides to, you know, it's like, oh, everyone likes their idea. You can still apply many of your insights that you prepared to that discussion. You know, they shouldn't be so specific to your idea that if your idea is not chosen, all of a sudden you have nothing to say, right? So be, be somewhat general in your preparation. Use specific departments, specific course ideas to put a frame around your preparation, but keep in mind, you know, ask yourself constantly, if I have to make a comment on, or if I have to contribute to someone else's idea, will I be able to flex my insights so that they apply to a a different topic altogether? Okay. That's really it. There's no need to read too much more into this prompt, right? They, they're doing you the courtesy of letting you know in advance what they're going to be asking you. Um, and they're giving you a chance to prepare, which is great because they, they could also do this by not, you know, with a blind topic, right? But, but they want you to at least do, do some of your homework in advance. So um, really think about, again, don't get too attached to your idea. Really think about preparing in a way that's going to give you some flexibility and some leeway. Okay. That concludes the first part of this presentation, which is really the overview of the TBD and some high-level strategies for how to succeed and how to prepare and how to succeed, which is a little bit more we're going to be talking about now. I'm going to go through three different scenarios of, again, their personality archetypes that you may encounter in the TBD. And by the way, if they look familiar, it's because these are personality types you are going to encounter in life, right? So um, whether in school previously or in your workplace or a former workplace, you probably are going to recognize at least one of these archetypes. Um, and there's nothing wrong with them. I'm simply bringing them up as examples in this, in this context of behavior that is not rewarded in the Wharton TBD. Um, it's behavior. It's also not rewarded in the classroom. Um, and you'll see why in a minute. So uh, as we go through these scenarios, ask yourself two questions. One, do you have, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, do you have honestly tendencies to exhibit any of these behaviors? And again, that's, there's not a, it's not meant to be self-criticism. It's simply meant to be self-awareness. Okay. So if you find yourself saying, yeah, you know what, actually that sounds sort of familiar. I, I do sometimes do that. Check yourself, take note of it and think about the second question, which I'm going to ask all of you to, to consider with these scenarios, which is um, what do you do? if you encounter somebody like this, right? Whether it's yourself or whether it's somebody in the TBD with you, um, what are some strategies and tactics to respond to that person in a constructive way, okay? Scenario one, and we're gonna have a little fun with this, okay? Scenario one is, we're calling the shark, right? Uh, Another word for this might be the bully. Um, So I'm gonna read this scenario here. Candidate A sets an aggressive self-centered tone in her opening remarks. As soon as the facilitator opens the team discussion, she grabs the spotlight and refuses to relinquish it. Each time someone tries to take the conversation in a new direction, she tries to steer it back towards her own idea while criticizing others' points in an unconstructive way. The team runs out of time to reach a recommendation before the session is up. Okay, so from that last sentence, you can see that this is not not an ideal outcome for the team, right? Um, The 35 minutes went by really quickly because somebody was hogging the spotlight the team was unable to achieve its objective, which was to actually come to a conclusion for the facilitator before the 35 minutes are up. So not a great outcome. Again, if you find yourself in a group like this, you don't need to panic. You're not being judged on whether you reached a conclusion. Ideally, you want to because that's the you want to present your ideas to the, the facilitator. But if you don't, it doesn't mean that you're doomed. It doesn't mean that none of you in that group are going to gain admission to Wharton. It simply means that's how the team dynamic worked out, right? And um, you might, if you find yourself in a situation where you're with somebody who's a shark, take notes, right? Um, Observe the team dynamic, not just the behavior of that person, candidate A, but how are you responding to candidate A? How are the other team members responding to candidate A, right? Be a sociologist, be be a psychologist, observe and and, um, formulate your own theories of what went wrong and what could have been done differently in this team discussion to reach a better outcome. And you know what? That's actually a great, um, that's great content for your one-on-one interview. We'll talk about that again at the end of this presentation, but um, one really, one way to turn around this negative experience, if again, if you find yourself in a group with a, with a shark, 
is to have a couple of smart, observant things to say about what, what do you think went wrong in that team dynamic? What could have been done differently? And bring that up with the facilitator in your one-on-one interview, because that shows that you are a thoughtful observer of human behavior, which is a big part of team leadership, right? Is understanding how people interact with each other. So that's, I, I would recommend if this happens to you, that is a really great way to turn it around, right? In, in the um, one-on-one interview, which is under your control, unlike the team-based discussion, the first 35 minutes. If you find yourself with a shark, the best way to handle these people is typically to acknowledge them politely, but try, and it might be repeatedly, you might have to do it more than once, try to steer the conversation back towards other members of the group. That could be yourself first, but then invite somebody else, invite a third party to step in. Perhaps when you finish, say, okay, thank you, candidate A, for your views. I understand your concerns about the accounting course that we've proposed. My personal take on this is blah, 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 blah. Jeremy, what do you think? Or Sally, I'd love to hear your thoughts, right? So now you've deftly steered the conversation away from candidate A towards another. So you're not just hogging the spotlight yourself now. You said your piece, your two cents, but then you've also invited somebody else into the conversation. And that, that's a really smooth way to help mitigate the impact of the shark. And the other thing, as I said, the other thing to keep in mind is um, take notes of what's happening, step back and try to watch the whole conversation as if you were a fly on the wall. And what are you learning about what's going on and how can you distill that into a smart comment that you can um, share with the facilitator at the end of your team discussion when it's time for your one-on-one. Okay, so don't panic if this happens. There's a lot of people out there who are like this. And think back to your own, again, your own workplace experience. You know, if you've encountered somebody like this, maybe they're your, they're your peer or your colleague at, um, in your company, or maybe they're your boss. Maybe there's someone who reports to you. How do you deal with that person in real life? Use those skills in the TBD as well if you come across somebody like this. Okay. Scenario two is a peacock, someone who likes to show off, right? So here we have candidate B, who rambles on and on during his opening statement, only stopping when the facilitator cuts him off. Each time he speaks, he either spews Wharton facts that seem unrelated to the topic at hand, or he tells stories about himself and his background that are of questionable relevance to the prompt. The team finds its focus drifting off topic constantly. Okay. Okay. This is a good place for me to mention, too, that the facilitator is unlikely to step in and intervene um, in the in the team based discussion. They, he or she is really there to observe the flow. Right. It, picture picture when you see in the movies or on a television show, a scientist who's conducting you know, observations on um, human subjects and they're standing with their white lab coat and the clipboard in the corner. Right. That's kind of what the ad comm facilitator is like. So do not expect him or her to step in. And, you know, if the conversation is being derailed, that's really on you guys. That's on the team to figure out how to get back on track. Okay. The one exception is they're keeping time, right? So if things are um, running over, they, they might say something or they might try to uh, at least notify the group of what's going on. But otherwise, they're going to keep their mouth shut during this time. So what happens if you find somebody who, and it's a little bit different. This The, the first example of a shark was somebody very aggressive, very critical, right? Um, which has a certain impact on a team dynamic. Someone who likes to show off, it, it's a little bit different of a, of a um, phenomenon, right? So here, the problem in this scenario is that the, the peacock keeps trying to bring the attention onto him or herself in a way that's not helping the, the point of the exercise, which is to get to a team conclusion on an arc, right? So he wants to talk about himself, but it's not even so much that he's ag- aggressively cutting other people down. It's more that he just wants to talk about himself. So here, um, again, what I said before with the shark, where you you can take your own observations internally and share those observations with the facilitator in your one-on-one interview, totally valid here too, right? Um, ad comms are looking for people who are have a high EQ, emotional quotient. They understand other people and what motivates them and how they behave. That's a very important quality in a leader. So that's a great way, even if the team discussion doesn't go so great, that's a great way for you to, to really shine in the one-on-one interview, if you can pick up on those uh, behaviors. Um, the other thing to do is it's, it's a little bit of the same strategy. So if you find yourself in a TBD with a peacock, same strategy I said before to sort of redirect the, and here the, the key is to make sure you get back on topic. So thank you, candidate B, for sharing, you know, sharing your background. Uh, I just want to make sure we're coming back to the question and keep it objective. It's not a personal attack on the peacock. It's about 
the team goal, right? And I think if you keep your focus on that team goal, first of all, it's going to, I think your teammates will appreciate the fact that you're trying to get back on track. But second of all, that's a focusing mechanism on something objective and concrete, which is, hey guys, we have a problem to solve. We ha- we're supposed to present an arc in 35 minutes. So let's come back to the problem, right? So I think that the, the um, what can quickly tip a peacock in the wrong direction and, and um, it, it can create, you know, put the whole exercise on a downhill <laughs> trajectory is if the peacock feels personally slighted or personally attacked, right? They want to be heard at the end of the day. So acknowledge them. We heard you. Thank you. However, let's remember objective, right? We're not being, it's not subjective. It's not personal. We're not angry at you, Peacock, but we got, we got an agenda, right? And so I think if you focus on the agenda and you keep it very, um, very, very scientific in some ways, very objective, that's a great way to sort of diffuse the Peacock and make sure that you guys uh, have time to concentrate on the actual assignment that you've been given. Okay. One more scenario. The wallflower, this is quite different. Candidate C speaks so softly during his opening remarks that the others have a hard time understanding him. His video image, remember we're doing this virtually, right? Um, His video image is dark and difficult to see. He doesn't assert himself in the team discussion, so he doesn't have any opportunity to contribute to the conversation, nor do any of the other candidates make any attempt to include him in the discussion. By the end of the TBD, nobody has a clear idea of what his ideas or position are. Okay, this is a this is a sad outcome, right? It's sad mainly because this candidate kind of whiffed on his opportunity, right? He was invited to participate in a group discussion and a group brainstorm, and he failed to step step up to bat, right? Now, the first thing I have to say is, um, for so actually, let me back up. If you think this is you, right? It could be out of shyness. It could be out of discomfort, um, either with a team setting like this, especially if there's other members who are more vocal and are more aggressive, um, even if it's in a positive way, right? Um, If you just naturally, your personality tends to be a little bit more obsessive or you you find yourself, you you like to listen to a discussion and maybe only at the very end, do you like to weigh in? Or maybe you prefer not to weigh in at all, but rather to ingest all the information, all the perspectives. And maybe you're somebody who actually processes information better offline. Maybe you're somebody who likes to then after the meeting, sit down quietly for 30 minutes, write a memo. And that's how you communicate your ideas to the team or the boss. If that's you, recognize it and know that this is not the time and place to fall back on those habits. Okay. You want to make sure, even if it's only once or twice in 35 minutes that you speak up. And that's not, that's not including the introduction at the beginning, right? Because that's, that's dedicated time you have. I'm saying in the flow of the team conversation, you want to make sure at least once or twice you're saying something, right? And um, the reason for that is you don't, um, just as you don't want to be a shark or a peacock and remembered by the group or the facilitator for the wrong reasons, you also don't want to be, you don't want to disappear into the background, right? You want to make sure that you're being heard. And again, part of, part of being part of a team is participating, right? So um, if you're not participating, you're not being a good team member, right? So uh, even if what you have is you feel like other people are saying things that are already occurred to you, nothing original to add, that's okay. Your contribution can simply be to underscore a point or to validate or um, support a point that someone else has made. So if someone just went before you and you said, gosh, that's what I was going to say. That's okay. This is not a class about inventions, right? Or innovations, or you don't have to come up with a brilliant new thing to say in order to speak up. You could, your contribution could be, you know what? I really like what Allison just said because X, Y, Z, give a reason, right? Because I've seen this happen in my workplace or because I, I see that the marketing department really doesn't address social media, whatever your comment might be, it's okay to support or, or disagree with somebody else too. Okay. So that can be your contribution and that's okay. Now, what happens if you find yourself in a group with a wallflower? Okay. You may not realize it. So for the first thing is to keep your eyes open. And re- if you see somebody on the screen who is not participating, take note of it. Your contribution might be to invite that person to the conversation, right? That's a great mark of a team leader as well. Somebody who is constantly monitoring the situation and, and keeping, not, I'm not, don't need to keep tallies, right? You don't have to keep score, but at least you have a general sense of who is speaking and who's not, right? That is a, that's a skill that a great leader has. And if you see that, you know, Johnny is actually being really, it's been 25 minutes and he is, you could actually speak up and say, Johnny, 
I know you've been quiet, but I would love to hear what you think. Like, I, I, you, I see that you've been listening very closely to the discussion. I'm, I'm really curious to hear what your thoughts are. That could be a great way for you to, that's, again, you are demonstrating leadership behavior by inviting somebody who's been a wallflower into the conversation, right? And don't worry about putting them on the spot. This is, you're opening the door for them to speak for themselves, okay? Um, so that's, I would say that would be my advice for you. Again, if you are the wallflower, think about how you can at least once or twice in the team to, um, conversation assert yourself, right, in a productive way. And if you see a wallflower, look, it's not your responsibility. No one's going to penalize you if you don't speak up and invite that person to participate. But if the opening comes, right, if there's a lull in the conversation or you're trying to gather everyone's opinions about something, this this is a really great opening for you to help the wallflower get a little bit more comfortable and, and create an opening for him or her to participate in the team discussion. Okay. Mm. So again, those are just three of the, um, I don't want to say most common archetypes. Let me just back up for one second. It's not that these are necessarily more common than other personality types, but in the team-based discussion format, there are three of the archetypes that tend to have a very distinct impact on the flow of the conversation, okay? Whether it's the shark, whether it's the peacock, or the wallflower. Um, these personality types, um, they're, they're very sort of distinctive within a team-based conversation format. So keep them in mind. And again, if you see this in yourself, make sure that you take the time to address it before the TBD. Okay, we talked a few times about the individual interview that comes at the end, right? So just as a reminder, you have 35 minutes of the actual team-based discussion. And then right at the end of that, you're going to go into one-on-one 10-minute sessions with the facilitator. The rest of you are just in a waiting room, right? So it's fine during that time. You can be, you know, it's okay if you need to be addressing work or emails or whatever, just to stay attentive to when you get called into your session. Um, but you don't have to sit there <laughs> blankly. Um, in, in real life, what happens when, when these were done in person is you would be in the waiting room with, with the other applicants. And that's actually a really cool experience because you get to chat with them. So um, when it's your session, it's a very quick debrief of the TBD, right? So the facilitator is going to ask you how you think it went. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to make some of those observations about the team dynamic. And again, it's not about criticizing or calling out individuals. It's not about puffing out your chest and saying how great you were in the TBD. It's about making, um, it's about pointing out insights that came to you while you were a part of and observing the team dynamic, right? So again, think, put your put your scientist hat on, put your sociologist hat on and say, if you were studying that group dynamic, right, what are some conclusions that you would draw about what went well, what didn't go well and diagnose it? You know, what do you think could have been done differently? What was the heart of the issue? Or if it went great, you know, why do you think you collaborated so well? That's the type of debrief that you want to be doing during the TBD and just a, just a couple of minutes, right? Cause you only have 10 minutes. Then the Facilitator might ask you one or two very basic questions, such as why Wharton, you know, why, why do you want to do your MBA now and why at Wharton? Um, so be prepared to talk about that. But again, it's such a short period of time. You're not going to go into a whole lot of depth, um, but this is, you do want to think about these questions in advance and make sure you have specific answers that are tied to your story and both your past, you know, maybe there's gaps in your resume that you want to fill at Wharton, or maybe there's resources at Wharton that you want to take advantage of going forward that are going to help you launch the career that you want to um, embark on post MBA. Um, and finally, just, you know, I thought you're, it's your chance to speak now or forever hold your peace. So anything that you might want to um, share, uh, maybe it didn't come out in your application or um, it was something that you just mentioned briefly um, in your essays and you really want to make sure the ad com knows about it. This is your chance to bring it up. Even if it's something that seems kind of random and isn't directly tied to the TBD itself, this is your chance to bring it up um, when you're in front of the ad com. Okay, we're nearly at the end of the um, presentation and we're going to switch uh, to questions in just a minute. I want to close on some tips for uh, general best practices for the virtual TBD, okay? If we were doing this in person on campus, these would be slightly different tips. But for, you know, of you now, the thing is, it's been 18 months now that we've all uh, in the COVID world dealt with video conferences and video calls. So much of this that I have to share with you in terms of best practices, you guys will be very familiar with already from doing Zoom, Google Meet, Skype, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is that software that you use. So some of it's going to be a little bit repetitive, but it bears it bears repeating because sometimes people, you'd still be surprised how many people um, neglect <laughs> these basic best practices. So 
please pay attention to these because these are just table stakes. Okay. Um, so as I said, you've all done this for 18 months. Um, technical settings, right? So this sounds obvious, but again, you'd be surprised how many people don't tend to these details. Internet connection. I know this is out of your control sometimes, and it seems, I, I know I've encountered this myself where you're on a very important video call. And of course, that's when the internet utility decides to go out and you're just left wondering how this is possible. Um, to the extent that you can, right, uh, uh, secure your internet connection, meaning, um, look, if you don't have a great internet connection in your home, is it possible you can arrange to do this at a friend's house, at a relative's house, um, at your workplace, right? At your office, maybe in a public place, like a public library, if that actually is the place that's the most reliable internet, do your research in advance. Um, again, chances are in this day and age, this won't be a problem, but it happens now and again, and you just don't want it to happen to you because of ill preparation, right? If it happens to you because literally the internet utility, there's a blackout on your block, you can't, you know, it, it's fine. Talk, call the admissions office, throw, there's gonna be a way to sort it out. They can put you in a new TBD. But you don't want this to be because of neglect, right? Because, well, you know the internet connection is spotty and you didn't do your homework to find a better location, okay? Make sure that's, do as much as you can there. Audio connection. So you can see actually in this webinar, I'm using um, just regular earbuds, right? Uh, and I do recommend this because you've probably noticed this with people who don't use them, um, either, you know, a headset or even something simple like this there can be echo, right? Depending on the acoustics of the room that you're in, um, depending on background noise also, it actually can be quite distracting. So you'd be impressed how much of a difference these make. And they don't look silly. We're all used to seeing these now, right? I would rather look a little bit funny wearing earbuds and be clearly heard um, and hear clearly myself than look cool because I don't have a, you know, a headset on, but then there's echo or there's background noise. So with these, the microphone does really pick up mostly just your voice um, and it tends to blur out the, the background noise. So no need to invest in something really fancy or expensive. If you have one of those expensive headsets, great, make sure you use it. But if you know, if not just basic, basic headphones, um, camera height and angle, right? So you all know how to now, if you're Chancellor, you use your computer, not your phone. I do recommend rather than using a tablet or a phone for this, do use a laptop or a desktop computer if you can. It, it is just a better experience. Um, play with the camera height and the angle, right? So uh, the great thing now is with Zoom, for example, or Google Meet, you can log in just to start your, your, your camera and you can actually position, you know, try the laptop screen at different heights, you know, maybe try sitting in a different type of chair. You want to be well framed, right? You don't want it to, you want it, the image to be just from your chin up. You don't want a strange angle, right? That gives you a double chin or uh, it's not flattering. Um, you know, we're not models, but you want to look professional. You want to look squarely in the frame. You want it to the extent that you can speak to the camera um, if you're not reading something off the screen, because that really does make a difference with eye contact as well. So you can experiment with that. That's the great news, right? We have the tools now. You can turn on Google Meet without anyone on the other end, and you can play with the image um, using your 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 screen or your if you have an actual webcam, modifying the angle of it until you get that you know nice square framing, you know sort of chest or neck up, um, and that with no distractions in the background. Okay, uh, we'll talk about background in a second. Lighting. Again, the great news is you can you have the tools at your disposal to check the lighting. So. At the time of day, right, I would suggest at least a couple days before your scheduled interview slot, the same time of day, right, go into the room that you expect to be in for the actual TBD and check the lighting. Um, if it's nighttime, you just want to make sure you have artificial light, like um, overhead light or a lamp. Um, practice, look at what it looks like on the screen if you have that lamp on to make sure you don't have strange shadows. Um, the worst is if you have light coming from behind you. You really don't want that because that's going to cast your face in shadow and no one's going to be able to see you properly. So make sure the light is in front of you or behind your computer screen, shining at your face, test it in advance at the same time of day in the room that you're going to be in so you know exactly what you're going to look like on screen. Background view. Um, you see I am in a, in a home office, so I've got some art on the walls, but nothing in my opinion, too distracting. Um, you know, I, if you see a room that's very cluttered with a lot going on in the background, that can be distracting. Um, or if there's a poster or a piece of art on the wall that is very large and maybe has writing on it, you that's not ideal. Look, if that's the only place you can be, that's okay. Don't beat yourself up. But to the extent that you can keep your background fairly neutral or use, um, you could blur it out as well. That's an option. That's generally a good idea. 
background noise, we've already addre addressed this. If you have a good headset or even just earphones, that should really help um, tamp down background noise. And if you are in a place that's quite noisy, when other people are speaking, you can always just mute your microphone. Um, but you have to remember to unmute yourself before you speak, okay? <clears throat> Attire. Mm. Business formal. So just as if you were doing this interview in person in Philadelphia, you should dress business formal, top and bottom, right? So don't make the mistake of wearing a suit jacket up top or, you know, a really nice blouse. And then you, you forget and you have to stand up for some reason during the interview and people see you're wearing basketball shorts. <laughs> so just wear the whole outfit as if you're going in person. Um, that's just going to give you peace. Of mind. And you will feel. Um, so many of us, we've been working from home for so long, you kind of forget that feeling of going into a workplace, going to an office. It feels it gives you different energy, right? So you want to feel that energy. Um, it's a little, you might feel a little nervous, but that's good. You, you want to feel like you're um, in your best form, on top form. And typically that happens when you're wearing business formal. So again, this means for men, generally a suit, um, you don't have to wear a tie. It's okay if you don't want to, or you prefer not to, but if you want to go for it. Um, for women, this would mean like a professional blouse on top. Um, I would not recommend anything sleeveless. Um, so either, you know, short sleeves or long sleeve blouse is great. Or if you want to wear a suit as well, women's suits or uh, a formal dress, a, pro a professional dress like you would wear to an office. Again, not sleeveless. I would wear something that at least has half or three quarter length or full length sleeves. Um, nothing too distracting. So I would stay away from patterns. Um, you want you know, something plain block colors, um, blue, Red, black, white, gray, these are all good. Um, not to say you can't do something a little bit different. If you if your personality is more colorful, sure, by all means, you can wear something a little bit more um, non-traditional. But again, remember, business formal, okay? You don't want to call attention to your attire in a negative way. That's the rule of thumb. And finally, remember how important body language is. Again, you've all been on video meetings. You've all seen other people and what they look like on, on screen when they're speaking. Um, especially when you're not speaking, remember that you're still on camera, right? And even if you've muted yourself, people can still see your face and they can still see your hands or anything that's, you know, within the frame of your camera. Um, so be very mindful the entire, it's, it's only 35 minutes, right? This is not two hours that you have to be focused um, and on point. So bear in mind your facial expression. If you're somebody very expressive, people can see your reactions, right? To other people's words. So, so remember that, okay? And then body language again. Don't be afraid to use your hands. Use hand gestures when you're speaking, um, not excessively, but uh, feel free to, you know, that's a way to also convey some dynamism in the video format. Uh, it's a lot easier to do that in person when, you know, body language is read much more easily, but even on the screen, body language is captured, but especially facial expression, okay? So just be mindful of that. All right, um, that is it. it. Looks like we have about 12 minutes left for questions. So what I'm gonna do here is, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to toggle back and see um, if Abhijit has any questions. Okay, so I see there's a question on the screen from Ashman. If somebody is quiet, I'm trying to pull him or her in. It's often more like they feel like I'm putting them on the spot. Yeah, it, it's a very delicate art, Ashman. It's a, it's a great point. Um, as I mentioned this when we were talking about the wallflower scenario, right? And uh, sorry, I'm apologizing, guys. I'm just realizing that I have <laughs> the sun streaming on my face. So I hope this is not good practice. You don't want this for your, <laughs> your DVD. But um, it's a great point that I brought up during the wallflower conversation. So look, there, there's not really a one size fits all answer for this. Um, it has more to do with is your, you know, you feeling out the room, right? So feeling out what the dynamic is with the five or six people who are there. Um, in general, I, again, I find it very helpful to phrase it not as, what do you think? Or you haven't said anything, right? Because that can sound a little bit critical. Um, I like to frame it as, I would love to know your opinion, right? And maybe you can it, make it really easy for them, very concrete by even, um, it's almost like doing a fill in the blank type of exercise. So you set up the sentence as follows. You notice that, let's say, Johnny is, is really quiet and um, Sally has just finished saying something about why she thinks it's important that more people understand accounting, right, in the business world. And so Sally has said, you know, I think we should do an accounting arc, blah, 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 blah. And you say, you know, Sally, that's really interesting because I work very closely with accountants in my day job. And I really find there is a gulf of understanding between many business practitioners and the accountants. And it seems like they're speaking foreign language. Johnny, I know that you mentioned in your introduction that you're actually a CPA. I'd really love to know your thoughts on what Sally and I have just said, right? So 
you you may not be able to do that if it turns out Johnny's not a CPA, right? I'm just using that as an example of how you pick up on details, right? You you should be taking constantly observing when people are doing their self introductions. Don't zone out, right? Don't be focused on what you're going to say. Listen, listen to what they're saying. Store away that data. It's information for you to come back to later in the conversation, right? And this is a good example of a time when you can actually use that to pull someone to the conversation without them feel, feeling like you're putting them on the spot. All right, other questions? Uh, let's see. Okay, I know Renon had asked earlier what the usual topics group discussions are. Um, do you guys know now what the specific topic is for this year? So we've addressed that. Okay, from Deepan. After completing the basic questions in one-on-one, -on -one, will the interviewer prompt us to speak about ourselves or do we have to take the initiative and express ourselves? This might depend a little bit on the facilitator. Um, some might just, it's a personal preference thing. Some might really ask you active questions. Others might really sit back and let you do the talking. So I'd be prepared with, like I said, a couple, you know, few speaking points about yourself. So whether it's, um, again, I would really think carefully about the question, why Wharton? So what is it about the school? And you, you will have done your research for the TBD, right? You should be spending a lot of time on Wharton's website, um, you know, on, the website's really where I would begin, right? Or maybe looking at their social media to stay current on what, you know, new happenings on campus. Um, so make sure you're well versed in all of that. And you can talk about why those, um, why certain aspects of the Wharton education and the Wharton experience really appeal to you, right? And why they're a great fit for your personal trajectory. So why Wharton? Why MBA, right? Why is it that at this point in your career, you want to do business school? Um, it is a bit, you know, you make a lot of sacrifices, financial and, and otherwise, to go to business school. So why why do you want to do it, right? Um, why is it right for you? So those are those are good things to prepare. And if you sort of get a, a quiet facilitator, you can volunteer that information. Um, and or if there are specific, um, like I said, specific aspects of your background that you feel were not fully communicated in your application itself, in the written application, or maybe new developments. Maybe you got a promotion, you know, since um, since you submitted your application, or maybe maybe you have a question for the interviewer. Don't be afraid. In a 10 minute interview, chances are you're not going to have opportunity to really ask questions of the interviewer. But um, if there's something that you really want to know about Wharton, he, the interviewer may or may not be positioned to answer it. Um, they're admissions committee members. They're not students. They're not alumni necessarily. So keep that in mind. Um, but it's more if there's something about your background that you really want to make sure they know about you, this is a good time to volunteer that information in case they don't ask you actively. Okay, let's see. All right, so I think Ashman has another question. How does body language play a role in an online setting? It's pretty different in my experience with taking interviews online. Do you recommend anything special or a poker face will be safe grounds? This is going to depend on you and what feels natural to you, right? Um, if you are naturally a very expressive person, um, that you don't, you don't want to fight that, right? It's important that you feel comfortable and you feel um, yourself during this interview. Uh, it's more, again, like I said, about being mindful, right? Just being cognizant that you are on camera. Um, and in some ways, you know, you're, you're right. That body language definitely plays a different, it, it expresses itself. It looks different online than in person, right? Um, you can still see body language, but it's more, it's almost more stark, than in a room, right? In a room, you have more context. Um, you have, versus on the screen, it becomes very two-dimensional. So it's not that you can't see body language. It's almost in some ways as if it's heightened, right? There's a heightened focus on a certain part of the body, um, particularly the face. So I think, um, do I recommend anything special to address your question uh, head on? Not necessarily. Um, I would say it, it's important not to look like a robot. So again, feel, be natural. But just remember that if someone says something that you really don't like and you do this kind of face, like people are going to be able to see you, right? They're going to, so, so is that a poker face? Not necessarily, but just be, be mindful that any expression you have might be magnified on the camera. So if you do express some surprise, maybe just kind of tone it down and keep it more mild. Maybe, you know, it's okay, by the way, to be taking notes on the side. I would steer away from typing on the computer because um, it's just, you can actually hear the key strokes sometimes and depending on your microphone, and it just, it seems like maybe you're doing something else on your computer. But if you're writing, like people are going to assume, okay, you're writing notes from the conversation. So that can be a good thing too, is 
if you find yourself an expression of what, what did he, what did he just say? If you're writing, right, it looks like you're concentrating on what you're doing on the side. So it's not so much about, oh, you have to keep a poker face or don't worry about that at all. It's just be mindful of the fact that people are going to be able to see your face and find little strategies for just mitigating the, maybe the, the magnitude of the expression. Um, and again, note taking is a great way to sort of, um, gracefully, right. And productively keep your facial expressions toned down. All right. In the last few minutes, are there any other questions? Let me make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, I just want to thank all of you for attending. I want to wish you all the very best of luck if you are um, scheduled to do a Wharton TBD soon. Like I said, this will be posted in the YouTube channel for GMAT Club. So um, you have the opportunity to rewatch it, uh, refresh your memory, or go back to any specific parts um, that you would like to revisit. And uh, as I mentioned before, if you'd like to do a free consultation with Admissionado, if you still have um, round two applications outstanding, or if you might think about reapplying in the future, um, you can find us on our website that GMAT Club has posted here in the screen. Um, we do free consultations with clients so you can get a sense of what it's like to work with us. So thank you again, and best of luck to all of you. Have a great weekend.